Uh, thank you for you to join here uh, for the conference. Uh, it's been it's my second time here, so uh, let's jump right into it. It's supposed to be a two-speaker talk, but uh, my speaker didn't get the my co-speaker didn't get a visa, so here we are. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's get right into it, right? Uh, my name is Aman, and I'll start with a bit of an introduction. Uh, I've been into uh, security for a very long time, around nine, ten years now. Started really young, and uh, uh, basically, I'm a hacker by profession, but I'm a developer at heart because that's how I started. And uh, my daily job basically uh, used to be red team and black hat and all of that stuff, uh, offensive penetration testing and simulation, basically. Uh, then I switched into social engineering and uh, uh, phishing simulation and uh, that part of the red team. And now I'm working at VMware as a security engineer. So now I'm on, on the defensive side, uh, working on uh, trying to get a more get more visibility as to how the big corporate uh, tech works. You know, the bleeding edge. How do that? How does that work? So I'm doing that right now. And uh, basically, I talk security, walk security, and of course, I eat security, as you can see. So there's that. Uh, and that's what I do. Uh, breathe, breathe this all the time. So uh, to give you an idea, when, when we used to do red teaming exercises, it's not a standard red teaming exercise that you might assume, where you know the, hack, the, hack, the red team is already inside, and there's an assumed breach scenario, and the, uh, there's a blue team involved, and they are, you know, uh, the team has an idea of what is the internal architecture and things like that. But uh, we don't do red team like that. Uh, the, uh, Agenda is more of an external red team, wherein we simulate a real hack. So what would happen if an organization is breached, right? Uh, if, if a hacker sets his mind to it, uh, what could he or she achieve, right? What, what is the depth? What is the outcome they can achieve? So that's why we don't get, uh, you know, any, some team that comes to us says, test my product. Instead, uh, I generally get, uh, we, we used to get projects where a CISO or even an investor would come and say, OK, I have 20 companies that I have invested in. Go show me what you can do. What would happen if somebody tries to breach in, right? So this is the case where uh, we were invited <coughs> by, uh, we actually wanted their project. Uh, we were invited by this billion dollar pharmaceutical company, uh, which is uh, in, in one of the largest in Asia. So they invited us. And obviously, this was a big project for a startup. And uh, we had to impress them. And they said, uh, the, for projects like us, they just give us the name of the company. That's it. We don't get any other information, right? So uh, that's, that's what happened. They gave us the name of the company. And they said, uh, get inside. I want to see if you can breach inside the corp network from the external, just the digital perimeter, nothing else. And uh, that's how the story started, right? And uh, the target was pretty simple. All the web applications, the networks, the servers, whatever is there uh, on the internet we were to breach that. Uh, we modified that concept of what is a digital perimeter, which I'll discuss in a moment. So uh, that's the objective, intra internet to internet. Uh, and you know everybody knows the story, how it goes uh, in this type of a scenario. You do basic your, your reconnaissance. You discover the assets, the web applications, servers, cloud applications, uh, internal employee portals, which are accessible, information about the employees, and stuff like that. And we did that. Uh, we found. Uh, your standard case of bugs like SQL injections, some RCEs, uh, some CVs that were exploited for some information disclosure, and uh, some vulnerable, vulnerable services and misconfigured services. This is your standard uh, pen test outcome, right? At least for us. <laughs> so uh, this was the. Let, let's have a look at some examples. So uh, this was one of Kentico CMS was one of the CMS uh, that these guys were using, and uh, basically this had an SQL injection. Uh, and DBA was true, so uh, straight story there to an RCE. But interestingly, what we did inside was, as this uh, uh, CMS had the uh, option to send emails, uh, we dug the SMTP auth, and it had a no reply at the red company name uh, email address with the password. And of course, uh, the next step was to you know start logging in and see what's what's there. So uh, other than that, it had some SAP functionalities which we exploited. Uh, there, were, there was a wildcard search uh, in SAP which we were able to exploit. And uh, the, from here on, we started digging into finding information about the employees of the company uh, to understand what exactly, uh, which employees doing what, what kind of access they might have. 
and uh, other than that, uh, there was this AirWatch installation which we found. Uh, AirWatch, uh, I, I assume a lot of you already know, is, an, uh, is a mobile device management solution. Uh, companies have these to, uh, to manage employee uh, mobile devices. And of course, it has a big ton of feature, uh, a lot of features like uh, installing digital certificates, installing applications, changing Wi-Fi settings and stuff like that. And uh, this was a test installation. That's what they claimed, that this is a test installation. Uh, and obviously, it was set up. We logged in. Uh, we brute forced some credentials of the employees. And it said, your password has expired. Please reset. So we said, gladly. So we did reset the password, got inside. And uh, basically, we had access to around 100 uh, employees, uh, which the application was installed. It was pushed to those phones. As, a, as part of a test group, but never removed. So they stopped using AirWatch, but the payload was still there in the mobile devices. And uh, we reactivated the AirWatch from here, and we started you know, getting inside uh, the mobile devices. Uh, once you are in with an MDMA solution, uh, sorry, uh, a mobile device, MDM solution, you get inside, and you, cha you can do a lot of stuff. So we, cha we change the Wi-Fi settings, install a, uh, add a phone AP, and go to the campus, have the uh, victim connect to your fake hotspot, install your digital signatures, HTTPS signatures, uh, SSL signatures, uh, so that once they connect to your hotspot, you get their traffic, right? We did that. We even did uh, use this information, carried out some phishing attacks, uh, although even if they were protected with two-factor authentication, but Evil Jinx uh, 2, very uh, tool, uh, I, I suppose a lot of you might know about it, uh, helps you fish 2FA credentials too by uh, by some neat tricks, uh, which I won't be able to dig in right now, but yeah. Uh, once that was done, we were able to gain access to the email accounts of 10 employees out of, what, 100, uh, which was a fair deal. And uh, meanwhile, uh, let's, let's uh, have a look at some other uh, OSN that we did. So when we look at a standard approach of uh, trying to attack these uh, employees, you look for deep web credentials, telegram bots, and online uh, deep web leaks, uh, public leaks, uh, all of that. We, uh, as me, as Red Teamer, and my colleagues, we keep on dumping these leaks uh, at a constant on Mega and stuff like that, huge, massive databases. And we keep indexing them so that uh, whatever kind of data leak is there, regardless whether it is a password or it's just emails or it's just mobile phones, uh, mobile numbers or stuff like that, we keep uh, collecting these dumps, right? And uh, this, is, uh, this is the standard approach, but we take it another step. We uh, stalk those people, stalk the employees. We go through their Facebook, Instagram, and stuff, LinkedIn, uh, send them invites, uh, have a chat with them, uh, trying to get more information. And then we even try to look, uh, we attack this. In a, once we get more information about the kind of employees, so a developer would have access to more information. Uh, HR would have access to LMS system, right? Stuff like that. So we uh, categorize these employees and we target them, right? We try to find stuff like Slack, uh, GitHub accounts, Azure, uh, and these things, G Suite, 0365. And we also uh, then try to map these employees to their personal accounts or see if these employees are using their uh, uh, employee e email addresses, company emails, on uh, non-standard websites. I've seen people using company email addresses on food delivery websites, travel websites, even dating websites. I don't know what they're doing, finding someone for their HR, uh, but uh, that's there. So once we get into these accounts, which are informal accounts, you get a lot of internal uh, working of the person uh, which we are trying to attack, right? So uh, this, you, you can refer to Awesome OSN for more information. But yeah, once we started doing that, uh, we were able to get inside the business management portal. Uh, with the credentials that we had accessed before, uh, and you know, uh, but we hit a roadblock. Once we had these 10 employees, uh, we got this message that says, uh, OTP is required when accessing the panel from an untrusted network. So we had the passwords. It was built on Ruby on Rails, only a login page, not much functionality. We weren't able to breach it. So, uh, but, so we stopped here. Now, this is a POC, right? We are doing this to impress the CISO uh, and tell him that, yes, we can get in if you give us the full project. And the story so far is we did gain access to some employee accounts. We had RCE on a couple of servers, uh, cloud servers, and one of the internal servers as well. So we could say we are in the co-op. Uh, we had access to a ton of customer data because we had access to some SAP instances and a lot of 
business logic issues, some IDOs and stuff. So we had access to their medical records and stuff, which uh, this company does. By the way, to give you a quick overview, they make, they make medicines, they experiment on medicines, they uh, sell formulas, they, they do bottling, packaging, labeling of medicines, so everything. They, they, you, they, you can hire them, they'll come to your house, collect your samples, give you a blood test. So this is, uh, they do everything, right? Uh, and the crown jewels uh, is what we got to next. So at this point, uh, we could have concluded the activity, could, could have concluded the POC and told them, see, we already have a bit of access, now give us the full project. But uh, I really had this thing at the back of my head, no, we have to get inside this employee panel. And that's why I decided to do something interesting. Uh, we decided to go war driving, right? Now, imagine this is a massive uh, campus, uh, thousands of square kilometers. So there are factories inside, there are SCADA systems, there are employees working there, there are scientists working there. Uh, everything is inside. It's a massive campus. We are there, and this is for dramatization. But uh, yeah, this is me in the front seat, uh, my co-speaker in the back seat, uh, our bonnets open at the middle of the night in front of the campus, uh, showing uh, we have opened the laptop right now for the, uh, for the purpose of the picture, but yeah, it was not this glowy, and uh, basically what we did over here is we parked our cars, we were war driving, we tried to see what kind of Wi-Fi signals we were able to capture. Uh, mostly it was 802.1x uh, WPA2 Enterprise, uh, and there was some open guest Wi-Fi's, right? And when you have guest Wi-Fi's, you know what you do. Of course, they were DMZ'd and all, uh, all of that were present, but Basically, we, we tried, the next objective was to militarize the DMZ, right? Uh, so we parked our vehicle on the roadside, and we started to trying to bypass this DMZ. And after a bit of recon, we found a redundant uh, switch, a Cisco switch, uh, which had uh, 2811, uh, Cisco IOS 2811, which had an RCE. So we gained root access, and we added a simple rule in the DMZ to allow us to get inside the network. Now, if you remember the, uh, if you remember the last problem we had, the error message on the employee login panel said, uh, you need an OTP if you're logging from an untrusted network. But hey, we are trying to get inside a trusted network. So it's the standard story, once we get a shell, it's standard your uh, uh, random stuff, you run responder, you run some PowerShell scripts, uh, you run your Cobalt Strike C2, and uh, obviously Windows machines are there, uh, there are, uh, most of the times they are misconfigured, and I'll tell you why they were misconfigured in this organization a lot, uh, which we'll come to later. But we started getting uh, NTLM hashes in Responder, and then we were able to get, uh, with, with a C3, uh, we were able to get uh, persistent access. And uh, this is Responder in action, we gained an access on uh, PowerShell scripts with Cobalt Strike. And then finally, we gained access to one of the machines which was part of the secured network. And voila, no more OTP. Right? This is the same employee panel, which has no OTP now, and now we can finally log in if, using the credentials of the uh, employees which we found before. So at this point, uh, we concluded the POC. The client was pretty impressed, and he gave us a go that, okay, you can now go and you know come into our campus, do a proper internal red team uh, uh, in an assumed breach scenario. Uh, of course, we could have shown him that we can now escalate inside into the corp network, find some servers, stuff like that. He didn't, uh, we, we didn't entertain that. He simply called us to the campus for a one and a half month uh, red team exercise. And uh, we flew there uh, inside this massive campus, which had really strict rules, like the rules to which side of the road you're supposed to walk on and not crossing the road. This is an internal campus, right? Internal roads with very strict rules and bad food, <laughs> but yeah. So we reached there, and now the objective was to pivot, avoid the SOC, which is there, obviously. Uh, they, they didn't have a proper blue team, but they had a SOC of sorts, and the agenda was to exfil uh, data, right? So we have already discussed, discussed the environment. It's a pharmaceutical brand campus, multiple buildings. The network security team uh, were very boasty. They were like, yeah, uh, uh, we, 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 have, we have not been hacked and stuff. And they were very qualified. I wouldn't say they were very, uh, I wouldn't want to say they were very good, but they were very qualified as in they had several PhDs and stuff. But I don't know if I'll call them good after the exercise. But um, the network security team was, yeah, pretty, pretty boasty. And uh, they had, of course, all the 
uh, internal firewalls, NATing, and DLPs, and VLANs set up properly. Uh, of course, we try to find ways into that. But yeah, uh, other than that, as I told you, there was strict compliance and access control rules uh, physically. So that you couldn't tailgate very easily. So that, that's our standard approach, but we didn't do that here. So once we are inside, uh, generally, of course, in a standard red team activity, you go and have a meeting with the, uh, the top people, and you ask them, what exactly are your crown jewels? So that's what we did. So in this case scenario, uh, we basically had the ICS systems. There, there was SCADA for all the machines that were doing all the bottling labeling stuff. Uh, then the most important crown jewels were the scientific data and the medicine formulas. So as I told you, there, there were experimental chambers where there were people in lab coats doing their uh, experiments. So they have their notes. They write down their notes. They have sensors uh, that measure temperature and all of, the, all of the other readings. So for us, it was very fascinating, right? Uh, me, particularly, I'm a very massive science enthusiast, not as a hacker, but I was very, uh, very excited to see all of that, that on one side of the room, there are people sitting in uh, like casuals and on, uh, like working on HR. And on the other side of the wall, there are scientists working with cool technology, right? So it was very fascinating for me personally. Uh, but yeah, so these were the crown jewels, right? The central medicinal database, the notes that these uh, scientists were taking, and the sensors which are there, right? Which are doing all of that stuff. And of course, there are other stuff which we'll get into. So, and coming to the access that we were provided, uh, we got a simple standard employee LAN access. Uh, they gave us a laptop, uh, and they said, okay, we have whitelisted your Mac, uh, two laptops only, connect it, and this is, a D obviously this was a VLAN with very limited access. And uh, of course, uh, as part of the crown jewels, we did ask for a detailed list of all critical servers, all critical Wi-Fi networks, and uh, all the VLANs and their restrictions so that we don't have to map that out. We did that as part, because we impressed them, they were able to, in the first exercise, they were able to give us this information in detail. So this is the kind of access we, pro they, we were provided, and we jumped into the standard approach. Uh, everybody is fam familiar with this, skip out the external uh, recon and external compromise. Uh, as in an assumed breach scenario, you find footholds, you try to escalate to a higher privilege, you, then you do internal recon into that network, do lateral movement, and keep doing the, repeating the cycle till you get in, uh, your crown jewels. But first things first, uh, what do you do when your NMAP scan is running? We had to play PUBG or uh, Modern Warfare or something, uh, but they didn't have access to, they didn't give us access to uh, Wi-Fi. So, uh, because we are hackers, uh, so-called, uh, we created a LAN hotspot with our Wi-Fi, uh, with our laptops to uh, play PUBG. But yeah, there's that. Uh, phase two, now, gaining access, pivoting, and escalating. Now, this is where we try to start digging in uh, inside the network and see wh what's happening. So again, standard approach, uh, you do recon, you do port scans, service scans, uh, you see what VLAN you are able to access, create a map of sorts, uh, do some sniffing, responder again comes to rescue, uh, you do the AD enumeration of course, find what kind of active directory environment you are in, how many forests are there, uh, all of that information which I'm sure you all are familiar with. Uh, we even uh, do internal phishing, uh, and by internal phishing, I wouldn't uh, actually like, not only sending emails, but I uh, like to go to the extent of wherever I find uh, an internal web server which has some login panel. I'll, tr I'll hijack the login panel so that it is sending me credentials. I'll uh, hijack internal applications. Instead of phishing them, I'll just poison uh, the applications which I have access to, right? So that I get credentials. So uh, yeah, there's that. Then of course, Bloodhound, Deathstar, stuff like that for uh, creating a map about the uh, Active Directory network and the ACL enumeration. Now, from this standard stuff, port scanning and all of that stuff, uh, we got access to something called HP Data Protect. HP Data Protect is basically a backup management uh, software, and uh, it was a very old version. Again, I'll come to this why, but this had an RCE in the main, uh, uh, this had an RCE, and because the backup uh, provider has to be connected to multiple VLANs, it has to be connect connected to employee machines as well as the main machines. Uh, once we had an RCE on the HP Data Protect server, uh, we were able to gain access to the main network. We jumped from the employee network to the internal network, right? And uh, once we did that, we, I found uh, there were some internal applications running. And again, pen, pen testing internal applications, I found an adminer instance. Uh, and let, let's look at that. So 
This is XP Data Protect. Of course, it runs as an NT authority system. So once there was an RCE, we owned the system. And from there on, of course, Mimi cards and stuff like that. Of course, uh, you do this in memory to avoid uh, DLPs and stuff, uh, and the intrusion, intrusion detection systems and AVs. Uh, you do, uh, Cobalt Strike is very, very powerful with that in memory injection, and uh, so that these uh, signature based and behavioral based are not able to capture it. Uh, but yeah, not getting deep into that. But we were able to extract uh, credentials. And as I told you, uh, I found an adminer instance uh, which was running slightly older version, had an SSRF, not very, not not a lot of exploits on this. But yeah, there was a way where you can where you could set up a custom MySQL server, and the vulnerability basically allowed you to uh, connect to an external server, but still use the MySQL instance to get the files of the adminer instance. So this is a very interesting issue uh, that was there in Adminer, uh, which allowed me to do a local in-file uh, command with MySQL and get the uh, critical files of the Adminer instance, right? So uh, basically, once I was able to get inside the Adminer, I ran some local in-file. To this is an example POC to get the ETC password. But later on, we got more information. And uh, obviously, as this was this was some kind of a blog, internal blog uh, that was there. Uh, and it was running on WordPress, so obviously the first thing that you do is read the uh, WP config. And that's what I did, gained access to the uh, database uh, credentials. And as we were already had an adminer, gained access to the database itself, right? Uh, logged in as admin to WordPress. Once we had access to adminer, changed the WordPress password hash, uh, got access to WordPress, uh, uploaded a shell, and uh, owned that server, right? Uh, so there was that. Uh, we were, other than that, we started recon on other servers because this was one of the dev machine. The dev was working on uh, this blog website. Uh, it was part of the dev network. The, it was a test environment, but the dev had access to it, right? So uh, we had to poison it. And in the dev network, there were other interesting things. Because these uh, developers were hosting applications very poorly, there were uh, RMI instances running. So we created custom beans uh, with SJet, uh, which uh, I, I assume you are aware of. But uh, if not, search it out. It's a uh, it's pretty neat tool uh, to create custom beans and exploit uh, vulnerable RMI instances. So there was that. Uh, with SJet, we were able to gain access to one of the servers, uh, and then one of the credentials, uh, with, with one of the credentials, we gained access to a dev, dev system which was running an Oracle DB. Now, when we come to this Oracle DB, uh, this database was very critical, but the problem was, uh, even if we have access to this database, it won't help a lot. Why? Because all of the information, like all of the scientist notes, all of the formulas, all of that stuff, is encrypted completely, right, in transit, and even when it is stored in the database, right? But uh, basically what we did over here is, uh, once we were inside the dev network, we uh, did some password spraying, we did some brute forcing, uh, and we were able to gain access to uh, some of the internal employees. From all of this action that we did, we were able to capture some uh, email addresses and passwords from a lot of places, password reuse and stuff. Once we did an internal spray, we gained access to around 15 uh, more employees. And all of us know, which is a bad practice, but everybody does, is sending passwords and critical information in email, right? Uh, so at the moment we gain access to uh, any email, uh, especially interesting email, we just search password, SSH, VPN, stuff like that, and generally gives out a lot of stuff, right? So this is 0365 and uh, all of that. But at, at this point, we still needed access to the scientific data management system, the SDMS. ELN, ELN is electronic lab notebooks. This is what scientists are using to uh, write their notes. And SCADA devices and the medical sensors. So here comes the uh, second compromise flow. Now, uh, the electronic lab notebooks and the SDMS, we had no idea what these things are, right? We had no idea how they work. We have no idea what's inside, what are the privileges. Uh, we didn't even know that the data would be encrypted inside, right? So basically what we did was uh, we started reading the big chunks of ma manuals. And this is where misconfiguration came in. The problem with this organization was because these electronic sensors and uh, all of the Elect, uh, the sensors, the note-making machines, uh, all of this infrastructure was very, very niche. So the software required to access it was also niche, produced by a very uh, small subset of organization. And once these people, uh, they had the vendors of these organization, for every single update that they had to push in on the servers, 
they need to they need to, to call ship a person from the vendor this is in a machine they will come they will do a six month a check whether it's failing or not there was a long it was a very very long process so this is where we found one business critical business logic issue basically how the company was doing business that had a flaw due to which they were not able to keep their systems updated. That's why a lot of machines that were connected to the uh, scientific data management systems, they, were, uh, they had a lot of legacy software in that, right? So old, old OS versions and all, uh, they were kept keeping it there. And uh, basically vendors, uh, they, they, as they are vendors, uh, they do not, the, the security rules shouldn't apply to them a lot. And they are using default passwords or weak passwords and stuff like that. And from here on, we started reading the manufacturing doc docs, and uh, the doc was pretty big. Didn't get a lot of information from it, but yes, there was a two hour long uh, YouTube video that explained how to operate these softwares. And uh, sadly, I had to sit through the entire two, two hours to find interesting information. And once I did that, I was able to, well, once the demo person was showing the demo, I was able to spot internal uh, directories, I was able to see the length of the default passwords, uh, the length of the passwords that the person was entering, and some default passwords that the person was talking about. So from these demos, we then started digging in and trying to compromise these uh, systems. So uh, we found some default passwords and some passwords we were able to brute force. We found some internal directories which had, which had some vulnerabilities which we were able to exploit and get some more information, but yeah. For the ELN, which is uh, Electronic Lab Notebooks, the company is Empower. Uh, of course, now it's all patched and stuff. But this was their vendor, which had the ELN. And uh, we were able to gain access to the Electronic Lab Notebooks. So now, as you can see uh, on the left side, each scientist has their own notebook. And if I click on it, there are actually notes that they are making every day about the experiments that they are creating. So this was a big win for us, right? We gained access to this was one of the crown jewels. Uh, but we still needed access to uh, SDMS. And uh, meanwhile, uh, once we were already on the dev workstation, uh, what we did was again set up the responder there, uh, look for NTNM hashes. In around two days, we got a hit uh, to one of the dev workstations which had Oracle. Uh, and there was Enterprise Manager running as the local instance. And we simply did a man in the browser attack. This is very interesting uh, for people who might not know about man in the browser. It simply injects. Uh, uh, your pivot inside the browser. Uh, one of the ways is to do it is via a proxy. And basically, whenever the uh, victim comes in, enters their passwords, uh, they get in. And because this was an Oracle Enterprise manager, uh, Management Server, uh, the, brow the only browser that was there was Internet Explorer, right? So it was easy to uh, <laughs> bypass the SSL stuff over there. So we injected our pivot. Uh, this is, again, a feature of uh, Cobalt Strike, man in the browser. If after two or three days, a developer actually came in to his browser, logged into the uh, Enterprise Manager, and uh, we gained access to it. Now, this Oracle Enterprise Manager had a lot of juicy uh, databases and credentials, uh, because this was a central stuff, right? This was uh, connected to a lot of tech. And uh, from here on out, even though, as I told you, I had access to the credentials, uh, uh, it wouldn't help. Like, I had access to the database, it wouldn't help because all of the data is encrypted. And unless the application, the SDMS actually fetches information from the uh, database, it won't be decrypted. So uh, from here on out, uh, basically Oracle Enterprise Manager has scheduled jobs. So I created a simple uh, script, uh, Oracle script, uh, to create a scheduled task that g gives me a reverse shell. This gave me access to the Enterprise Management Server. And from here on out, I started reading log files. Uh, there were some custom log files. There were some standard log files. And as you would guess, uh, there were uh, files like password.txt and do not delete.txt, which contained other sensitive information and stuff like that. So there were some sometimes juicy information sitting right on the desktop because the developer is assuming nobody connects to these machines. Uh, the password is not known. This is a personal machine, or it's managed by a very limited set of people. And to ease out the access, they keep these credentials. It's just like putting your sticky note with a password on the monitor. And we started reading these logs files and these text files, and we gained access to the default configurations. So one of the SDMS we gained access to finally. And uh, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, honestly, even I cannot. But 
uh, believe me, uh, yeah, this did contain scientific data management system. This did contain the formulas uh, and all of your, uh, the pills that they were making, all of the chemical formulas for that. Uh, we finally gained access and because we had a password, uh, even if we had the database access and the data was encrypted, because we had a password now for this application, we were actually able to decrypt that data. And uh, here on out, it was game over. Not really, but yeah, we did have read and write access to the lab notebooks. We, did, uh, we could con control the form medicinal formulas, so change your paracetamol to MDMA and happy pills, right? So uh, there was that. Uh, we didn't do it, uh, but yeah, it sounds nice. So uh, we could actually control the printing, labeling, and uh, we, we needed access to the printing, bottling, and labeling machines. That was the only thing left, the SCADA devices, right? Uh, but we had access to all the proprietary formulas. And imagine, uh, if you talk about business impact, imagine changing the paracetamol to MDMA and short the stock. Or imagine logging into SP Data Protect, short the stock, delete all the backups. Stuff like that, that was spinning around my head, didn't do it, tried to keep my calm, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Uh, the final step over here, our final compromise flow, was the IMS. This is inventory management system. This is where your medicines are packed inside bottles, labeled and stuff. So uh, for that, uh, interestingly, so while we are doing these kind of red team exercises, we found, for example, we found uh, vulnerabilities in the lab notebook softwares. We found vulnerabilities in the SDMS softwares. Uh, similarly, we find uh, these kind of zero days in a lot of softwares. Uh, sometimes we have them reported, a lot of times we cannot publicly report it, but we have them patched. But uh, that gives us a benefit that we generally have a lot of, uh, we have a good chunk of zero days with us, right, uh, during this, without, without of this process. So uh, in the inventory, uh, to access the inventory management system, we basically compromised the entire forest, uh, the domain forest. How? They were using the uh, inventory management system, uh, which, which had a zero day, and the zero day was an SQLI RC, which is again, we found this during another exercise we were doing for another company. They were using the same old version of the uh, IMS software. And IMS is basically, IMS is used to uh, control the uh, laptops and servers and desktops of the uh, people, manage the AD and stuff like that. So once we use the RC, uh, SQLI, the SQLI was basically an un uh, unauthenticated SQLI. So we use the unauthenticated SQLI on the inventory management system uh, to get the password of the admin, and then we basically gained access to the inventory management system, which contained our entire AD configuration. And from here on, we could like literally schedule a job, deploy a zip file, deploy a exe file. So you understand that inventory management systems are basically used to deploy softwares, deploy patches. So we deployed a simple uh, vulnerable, like uh, obviously obfuscated and may, uh, AV proof uh, uh, payload on the domain admin. And uh, once that executed, we gained access to the DC and it was game over from there. Uh, once we were in the DC, uh, I tried to find out where are the printing, uh, packaging, bottling, labeling systems. And this was the exact scene in my head while I was controlling the SCADA. And because I had access to it, I could actually uh, I gained access to this device, which uh, does carton printing, case packaging, pharmaceutical bottling, labeling, and uh, I, I don't even know what this is, but yeah, some conveyor system. <laughs> so yeah, uh, this is where uh, we finally gained access to the database credentials of Retrack. Retrack was one of the SCADA devices which did the bottling and labeling. And uh, that was mission accomplished. We took access to uh, like all of the uh, all of the crown jewels, I would say. We gained access to databases, we gained access to SDMS, we gained access to SCADA devices, we gained access to uh, ELN, and we could literally, uh, literally wreck havoc. And uh, could earn a billion dollars, but that's a different talk. Uh, key takeaways. So uh, this is again, I'll skim through it. Uh, but yeah, uh, external recon when we do uh, not only subdomain enumeration and all of that is fine, right? Everybody does that. But what we see literally helps us a lot is constant monitoring, right? Uh, like we, when, once, when, when we are red teaming, we keep an eye out and make sure that we are always listening for new uh, IT on the network, on the internet. 
So we are listening, we are scanning the JS files, we are scanning the API documentations, we are scanning, we are scanning the, uh, brute forcing the subdomains every day to find out if there are new assets. Once there are new assets, that means they, it, they are not audited properly, at least not externally. Or uh, they, they, it has, there are higher chances that these new assets would be, would be vulnerable, right? So uh, that's there. Reverse who is again helps a lot, uh, full port scans, uh, Shodan helps, census and all of that. Uh, JS analysis, as I mentioned, uh, we have an internal engine that does JS analysis, find internal assets, and keeps a, uh, keeps a change log of sorts, uh, and tells us if there are new APIs introduced uh, via JS and other front-end frameworks, so that is really helpful when discovering uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, parameter and header brute forcing, of course, you are aware of it. It is really helpful. And uh, cache URLs from Web Archive, uh, I'm sure all of you are already uh, doing this. And then employee OSINT is something which really helps. Uh, leaked credentials uh, and OSINT from em for employees actually works, right? It's not that, it's not, uh, there is not only Shiverbot or uh, what, 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 are, what is your uh, leaks, the standard leaks. It's not just that. If you have a good database of uh, leaks, passwords, you would re really be able to gain access to a lot of employee stuff, given the recon on that employee is nice. Okay? Uh, just a sec. Yeah. Moving on. Internal recon, of course, everybody does full port scans, automated scanning was Nessus and stuff. But yeah, uh, Insight VM uh, we found pretty helpful in this case. Uh, once we, when we were not on our workstations, uh, went for lunch, we generally ran Insight VM. Uh, this was a, uh, this gave us better results than Nessus. Interestingly, we don't generally use, uh, so I'm not super versed with uh, these automated vulnerability assessment tools because we uh, avoid using them because they're very noisy. Uh, but yeah, Insight VM. Once we uh, did uh, this entire activity, uh, we did run proper internal scan to ensure there are not uh, any other uh, things like HP Data Protect and stuff. Insight VM, pretty helpful. Uh, VLAN testing, sniffing, responder stuff, AD enumeration, uh, internal phishing, and as I mentioned, uh, once you gain access to an internal page, try modifying, it, try modifying it, right? Change the password, uh, change the login file, add a backdoor in that so that you receive passwords uh, in all as many portals as you can. So yeah. Internal recon, read the API documentation as much as possible. And coming to footholds and exploitation, uh, there are a lot of uh, nice C2s that you can utilize. Uh, Cobalt Strike, uh, everybody's aware of. But uh, try, try looking at Quadic, try looking at Empire, try looking at PowerShell Empire. Uh, Armitage Teams is very nice. Covenant is also a very, very good C2. These are some C2s which are sparsely used. We don't see them being used a lot. Cobalt Strike is used a lot uh, because of uh, good documentation and you can actually write your custom beacons. Uh, so that functionality is really phenomenal with Cobalt Strike. But yeah, a lot of times uh, these signatures might get detected and some other C2s like Coedic and Covenant, these will uh, help out in scenarios where you want to uh, run a C2 on a Linux environment or a Mac environment maybe, right? So in those cases, try out other C2s and C3s. Uh, then. Third-party vendors and portals is a big target for us. Uh, we target them a lot. Uh, again, comparing Git diffs, uh, whenever there is an internal patch, a lot of like companies, especially Oracle and stuff, uh, Drupal, for example, they release internal patches. There is no documentation on the exploitation. So you can easily, obviously, anybody can go uh, check out the diff, find out what part of code they changed, and try to figure out why, why did this patch. If this was the patch, what would be the vulnerability? If this is the vulnerability, how would we enter it? So this was, we did this for one of the deserialization issues in Drupal a couple of years back. But yeah, uh, comparing Git diffs for uh, public applications really helps. Uh, reverse engineering mobile and desktop applications, once you find them, internal applications can lead you, it does help us, uh, it leads us to internal assets, uh, developer consoles, which have functionality which is disabled in the client application. But if you reverse engineer these applications, uh, you will be able to find out a lot of stuff inside them. So, yeah, uh, of course, you have to customize the payloads because AV is uh, paid in the ass uh, a lot of times. But yeah, uh, AV evasions, there are a lot of techniques you can find 
but yeah, the main idea is to make custom stuff, to make custom beacons, uh, which uh, do stuff in memory, uh, find uh, ways to execute payloads from trusted sources. Uh, uh, so here you are, token impersonation, uh, there you can execute payloads via group policy modifications. Uh, uh, we, we had cases where we were able to pivot to McAfee, <laughs> the agent itself once we compromised and because it had a lot of access and it was a trusted EA binary, uh, it, uh, it was working. So yeah, uh, obfuscated payloads and stuff, in-memory injection, file, uh, <laughs> interesting, very old technique that still works at a lot of places is uh, like you might, a lot of, uh, a lot of times signed binaries are not allowed, unsigned binaries are not allowed to execute. But uh, IE Express, which is there since, I don't know, Internet Explorer, is a packaging tool, is a uh, is an MSI creation tool, which you can use to create setup. And in the setup at the end, this is a functionality provided by Windows itself, there is an option to actually uh, add a completion command, and that becomes a signed Microsoft binary. So this uh, used to help us a lot, uh, at least uh, at least till uh, last year, this was working. Malleable C2, Cobalt Strike, if you aren't using that, please go ahead. Research about it, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, really, I back that. Uh, uh, if only they bring the price down, but yeah, to make it accessible to normal people. But yeah. Uh, post exploitations, obviously, we are aware of the common AD exploitation and AD enumeration tools. Uh, stuff like Power Up, Nishang, uh, Responder, Mimikatz, Mimikittens, and Mimi Penguin. Uh, these are the uh, Mac and Linux alternatives. Uh, browser harvesting, man in the browser, and uh, you know, as I mentioned, read the source code, read the log files, uh, try to find something interesting there. Uh, browser pivoting, again, in Cobalt Strike, a very good feature uh, that helps, and a, a very, uh, very, very helpful tool that helps us in getting reverse shells in office, uh, in very, very marginal environments, environments which are protected, is something called ABPTS. I'm sure a lot of you would have heard about it. This, it's, it's a black path towards the sun, weird name, but uh, this basically helps you to create a reverse HTTP tunnel. Uh, you would be aware of reverse SSH tunnel, but this, but this basically gives you a reverse HTTP tunnel, uh, a very, very helpful tool. Uh, one, if, if there is a, uh, if there is a web application and you want a reverse shell, but all outgoing connection is uh, uh, like not allowed, you can create an HTTP uh, tunnel, uh, host it on a particular endpoint on that application if you have access to that. And then using your Cobalt Strike or whatever C2 you are using, you can connect to that with ABPTS. And that will all be HTTPS tunnel. And uh, what we like to do is uh, once we make the C2, we generally download the HTTP, the SSL signature and sign all our requests with that, uh, encrypted with their own signature, uh, with their own certificates, which uh, helps a lot in uh, going through the different kind of DLPs that are there, right? Uh, Metapreter we've stopped using uh, since we started the Cobalt Strike and stuff, but yeah, sometimes it's helpful. Uh, Multi-level pivot in Metapreter is pretty helpful. And now coming to staying under the radar, uh, OneDrive and Dropbox uh, exfiltration is really, really impressive, especially from normal employee machines. Uh, so generally when we try to exfiltrate, we don't generally take some out of the box tool to do it. We try to first identify uh, what kind of systems, uh, what kind of uh, third party services is that employee using. And then we try to hide our traffic with that. So uh, we generally try to exfiltrate uh, data with OneDrive, uh, uh, with O365 or Dropbox, if they're using that, or Google Drive, there are tools uh, that you can use that will automatically exfiltrate your data. Uh, and of course, if you've, done your, if you've done your browser pivoting well, if you've done your man in the browser properly, you can actually do that from the employee's credentials, and you don't have to host it to your uh, drive. You can host it to their drive and delete it, stuff like that. So uh, then SSL impersonation, as I mentioned, all of the payloads, all of the traffic, the moment we find an internal uh, private key, we sign everything with that. We sign our binaries, uh, we sign our uh, SSL traffic, uh, whatever we're doing, communication that is happening, we do it with the company's uh, signatures, their, with their keys, so that helps in do, uh, hiding a lot of traffic. Then in-memory execution, of course, wherever possible, this helps a lot, and finding ways uh, to execute uh, your payloads from trusted stuff like run DLL and 
uh, reg uh, sorry, uh, registry and group policy executions and stuff like that, uh, we, we, we have seen it uh, very effective. And impersonation is very important, which uh, I personally, uh, with a lot of experience that I have with creating phishing campaigns for a big part of the Middle East and the UK and the Southeast, uh, Southeast Asian continent, uh, impersonation is something I take pride upon. And uh, because, you know, uh, good at stalking. So <laughs> I stalk internal employees and then impersonate them. Uh, you, you might have heard about that case where uh, the Slack was sold on DeepWeb, uh, developer's Slack account, and this person was able to get a lot of internal data, default passwords, uh, current passwords, installations, and all of that by sending SMS from that employee's Slack, Slack cookie, right? So uh, domains, uh, accounts, certificates, applications, impersonate everything, right? Uh, finally, exfiltration. Uh, Cloakify Factory uh, is a very good text-to-text -text, uh, exfiltration tool, which we uh, use a lot. Text-to-text, uh, -text, you, you would have heard about uh, exfiltrating uh, in music files or image files and stuff like that. Cloakify does a text-to-text. -text. So it will, uh, let's say you have an ETC password file to export, it will create a long story about some random village with some random farmer, and the ETC password file will be there inside. If you read it, it's a story. So that's Cloakify Factory. Uh, bind shells over HTTP proxies. This is ABPTS. DNS exfiltration, uh, I ICMP exfiltration, and uh, Empire, uh, by the way, has the Dropbox exfiltration by default. Empire, the C2. So that, there's that. So that sums it up. Uh, and yeah, I think that's it. I can take some questions now. But yeah, for more questions, you can reach out to me on uh, Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever you feel like. Uh, but yeah, there's that. I can now take questions, but uh, that's the end of slides. Thank you. On va faire une petite session de questions réponses. Trois, uh, quatre questions en anglais. Hello, uh, thank you for your talk. First, uh, my question is about your SOC evasion. You talked that uh, they had a SOC team, but you didn't uh, uh, present how you escaped them and uh, if they found you at some time and how you came back if you, if they, yeah. if you were found. Okay, so uh, if I understood, understand your question correctly, uh, you're talking about the SOC team, whether they found us, how did they find us, how were we able to evade? So. Uh, we were uh, caught, uh, it was not the SOC team, it was the physical security team. I was roaming around the campus with my laptop and an uh, alpha card stuck to it and walking like this. And uh, he caught me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm the IT engineer. I'm checking the strength of the Wi-Fi. So he's like, okay. Uh, but yeah, SOC team, uh, they were able to identify some, uh, a lot of traffic because one of our, uh, one of our scripts uh, went a bit, uh, it had a bug or sorts. Uh, it poisoned a lot of stuff and did a lot of uh, noise, and we were caught there. Uh, but yeah, we, we recovered uh, because we had access to a lot of systems. What we did was create a lot of uh, white noise. We started creating noise from all the machines, and uh, that, you know, uh, masked our noise. So that's how, that's a few of the cases. But because they, I, I wouldn't take pride upon the evasion of SOC team in this exercise, because I would say they weren't that good. Uh, they weren't super extreme. Uh, they are not your uh, state-of-the-art blue teams. They were not that. Uh, but yeah, they were doing something. And this is, again, legacy stuff, right? Imagine uh, putting a DLP on a scientific data management system. It's a nightmare for the CISO. Uh, it, the implementation itself is extremely difficult. So yeah, that's why the, it's not that these people were not skilled or didn't have the budget to deploy the state-of-the-art uh, technology. It's just that their dependency was so uh, backdated, they couldn't deploy a lot of modern solutions. Yeah. Next question. Can we hand a mic to this gentleman? Uh, 
thank you for the presentation. Uh, mine was pretty same the the question of the SOC team. Uh, and what about the, their dev uh, environment? Uh, did the SOC uh, was monitoring this part of? Uh, monitoring what? The dev. The, the dev. the dev. The development uh, network that you were talking about. Uh, it was being monitored, but then again, dev do a lot of stuff, right? Uh, we had this case, interesting case, where we were assisting a blue team. So I'm, I'll give you an example. We were assisting a blue team, giving them some tips. There was a case where this HR was using PowerShell. We flagged it, right? Of course, why would an HR use PowerShell? Like, not, not belittling any HRs. Uh, you can go do uh, PowerShell, but no. Uh, <laughs> I, I would not expect an HR to run PowerShell. Uh, but devs, you expect a lot of them, a lot of things from them, and that's where the lack of expected behavior is a problem, right? That's why I preach upon anomaly detection systems. Instead of behavioral analysis, look for anomalies. As the blue team, you should know, uh, I would say detecting anomalies is what helps. In our case, the devs were being monitored, but, but because we were masking our traffic, because we were impersonating devs themselves, we were not using any kind of, you know, uh, some, some meter pretter noisy uh, Hail Mary attack or on our meter or stuff like that. So we were masking uh, things because we were aware of the blue team practices. Uh, we uh, note, note them down. We tried to uh, skim through uh, between the ridges. So that's, uh, I would say 90% of it uh, went through. They didn't even notice. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have any other questions? All right. Uh, for anything else, I'll be outside most probably today. Uh, uh, if you want to grab a beer, I'm always here. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Aman. Thank you, Aman. Thank you very much, Aman.